Our next major topic of discussion in this lecture has to do with how we define life in biological circles. Let's say that you find an interesting thing out in nature, and you want to know whether it's living or not. Is it a living thing such as a fungus, or is it a non-living thing such as a rock? It turns out that there are eight characteristics that a thing has to have in order for us to consider it alive. And we're going to explore that next. If it doesn't have all eight characteristics, then we put it in the non-living things category. And yes, there are some interesting things out in nature that are kind of on the border between those two categories, such as viruses and prions. To illustrate this, I'd like you to watch a couple of videos of this thing. One video will show it from the side, and one video will show it from the top. And I want you to decide whether or not you think this thing is alive, and more importantly, if you think it's alive, why? Try to describe why you think that thing is a living thing or not. What are you looking at? What's telling you whether it's alive or not? So if you decided that, yes, this organism is alive, you are absolutely correct. This little critter is known as a Daphnia, or a water flea. They're totally harmless, they don't bite you. They're microscopic, and they live in fresh water, and they use these long mouth appendages things to catch little things in the water, such as paramecia. Now what is it that tipped you off that this was a living thing? Well, it can kind of be hard to put into words, but it may have been that you were noticing the first characteristic that all living things share, which is that they are all complex and they are all organized. They're not random, like some things that we find in nature. One of the really neat things about Daphnia is that their skin is kind of clear, so we can see inside them under the microscope. And if you look inside this Daphnia, you're going to notice some things that might be organs, and some things that might be organ systems. They even have some sense organs, like a little eye up here. And that level of complexity and order is often characteristic of a living thing. The second characteristic of all living things is that they are all composed of cells. If you remember, cells are the smallest unit of life. They are these tiny living packets, and they're typically too small to be seen with the naked eye. Now, there are many different types of cells in different types of organisms, but all cells have these three characteristics in common. All cells have some genetic material, some DNA, sometimes inside a nucleus, sometimes not. But these are the instructions for telling the cell what kind of cell it's going to be and how it's going to function. All cells have organelles, these little organs, little packets that perform different jobs inside the cell. And all cells have a plasma membrane. This is the kind of skin on the outside of the cell that separates the internal environment from the external environment. Living things consist of one of two types of cells, eukaryotic cells or prokaryotic cells. There are three important differences between these types of cells. First has to do with size and complexity. Eukaryotic cells are typically much, much larger and much more complex than prokaryotic cells. The second difference has to do with how the DNA is stored. They both have DNA, but Eukaryotic cells store their DNA inside a nucleus. So there's this nice packet of membrane around the DNA inside a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells also have DNA, but they store it in kind of a wadded up circle inside the cytoplasm. So there's no big membrane, no packet around the outside. So we say that eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, but prokaryotic cells do not. The third major difference has to do with the types of organelles we find inside these two types of cells. Eukaryotic cells have what we call 
membrane-bound organelles. And that means that the cell membrane extends into the cytoplasma of the cell and is used to surround these organelles. So again, they make these nice little consolidated packets that can interact with one another. Prokaryotic cells also have organelles, but they're not membrane bound. Again, everything's just kind of floating around free inside the cytoplasm. Eukaryotic cells include things like animal cells, plant cells, fungus or fungi, and these things we call protists. Prokaryotic cells, on the other hand, are things like bacteria and some weird guys called archaeans. Third, all living things have to be able to respond to stimuli to respond to the environment in order to stay alive. This can be on the whole organism level. For instance, if you poke a millipede, its response will sometimes be to curl up into a little ball to protect itself. Or this can be internal on the biochemical level. For instance, if you rub a plant leaf, there are certain biochemical reactions that are going to happen inside that leaf as the plant tries to defend itself from you. So all living things have to be able to respond to the environment in order to stay alive. And being able to respond to the environment is one of the characteristics of living things. Fourth, all living things have to be able to maintain homeostasis in order to stay alive and in order to be considered a living thing. Homeostasis is all about balance. It's the ability to maintain a stable internal environment despite a constantly changing external environment. Let's take body temperature as an example. Our body temperature is because we are warm blooded, tends to stay at about 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, no matter what the temperature outside is. If it starts to get really hot outside though, our body temperatures might start to go up. How does our body respond? Well, it makes us sweat, and the sweat is designed to help cool us off to keep that body temperature at around 98.6. Now think about all of the things, all the factors that a body has to keep in order around these set points in order to keep you alive from one moment to the next. If you think about it too much, it gets a little scary. But there are temperature factors, there are chemical levels, there are neural events, electrical events within the body, the position of your body, all of that stuff has to be kept stable in order for you to stay alive. Whenever these things get out of whack, we refer to this as a homeostatic imbalance. And I think of it as being kind of like carrying a tray full of drinks that suddenly gets out of whack, gets out of balance. It tips one way, one thing gets out of balance, and then it tips the other way as you compensate and back and forth. And before you know it, organs are crashing and drinks are all over the floor. That's a homeostatic imbalance. Diseases, injuries, and disorders are things that push our bodies out of balance. And so sometimes these things are referred to as homeostatic imbalances. Maintaining a homeostatic balance depends on something known as feedback. Feedback refers to how your body responds to a particular stimulus, and there are a couple of different kinds of feedback. Positive feedback, in general, tends to increase the stimulus, whereas negative feedback tends to decrease the stimulus. Let's use this mouse as an example. When this mouse encounters the cheese, it's going to eat some of the cheese, and that's going to tell its brain, ooh, I really like that cheese. We should keep eating more cheese. That's an example of a positive feedback system. The body responds by trying to increase the stimulus. Now on the other hand, if the mouse encounters a cat, its brain is going to tell, tell it, less cat please, let's get out of here. And so it's going to cause the muscles to make the legs pump and make the little mouse run for his life. We would refer to this as negative feedback because the mouse is trying to decrease the stimulus. The next set of your turn questions is going to present you with a couple of different scenarios, and I want you to think about and decide what kind of feedback is involved in each of the scenarios.
For instance, if it's hot outside and you're sweating, does that represent positive feedback that's trying to increase the stimulus or negative feedback that's trying to decrease the stimulus? Also, when an infant nurses, is the, the reaction in the mother's body releasing more milk, is that increasing or decreasing the stimulus? Is it positive feedback or negative feedback? Characteristic of life number five. All living things have to be able to acquire materials and process energy in order to remain alive. Materials are these things we call nutrients. Nutrients are the things that we use to physically build our bodies. They can include everything from atoms of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen to more complex molecules such as carbohydrates and proteins, and they even include vitamins and minerals. We need all of these things to build our bodies. Now energy, on the other hand, is a little different. Energy is the sort of force that makes matter do things, that makes matter perform work. So in order to make our bodies work the way that we want them to, you have to have a certain amount of energy. Nutrients and energy behave differently inside food chains such as the one shown. Nutrients tend to be recycled as it passes from one organism to the other. However, energy tends to flow through an ecosystem. Let's take a look at nutrients first. Nutrients are those things we need to build our bodies. So plants such as this tree and such as the grasses shown here take in nutrients from the soil and also from the air and they build their bodies. Now when the herbivores such as the zebra eat the grass, that organism takes in some of the nutrients and uses those nutrients to build its body. And when the predators such as this lion eats the zebra, it does the same thing. When these organisms die, the nutrients aren't lost. When this lion dies, for instance, things like fungus and bacteria are going to break that body down and take the nutrients back out and they use them to build their bodies. So the nutrients are constantly being recycled within this ecosystem. They typically don't leave unless an organism leaves the ecosystem. Now energy, on the other hand, tends to flow through ecosystems. What do I mean by that? Well, energy is first released from fusion reactions that occur in the sun, and they strike photosynthesizers, such as the tree and such as the grass. These photosynthesizers take in some of this energy and incorporate that energy into their sugars, so they make their own food. They then can use that energy to power their reactions. When the zebra then eats the grass, it takes in some of the energy from the grass and uses it to power its reactions. And when the lion eats the zebra, the same thing happens again. Now the energy doesn't stay inside these organisms very long. A lot of this energy is going to be lost back into the environment as heat. And yes, even trees release heat. So the energy flows in and the energy flows back out. And that means that unlike nutrients, ecosystems need a constant supply of energy in order for all of these organisms to continue to survive. Characteristic of life number six, all living things from bacteria up to humans grow and develop. They all have different stages to their life cycles and they all change physically and otherwise as they go through these different stages. Characteristic of life number seven, all species have to be able to reproduce themselves in order to continue existing on the planet. Single-celled organisms, such as these shown here, tend to reproduce by dividing, by cut, sort of cloning themselves and splitting in two. Multicellular organisms have more complex ways of reproducing themselves by recombining their genes with other individuals, or sometimes they have some tricky ways of cloning themselves as well. Characteristic of life number eight, all living things evolve. And here again, by all living things, I mean all species evolve, not all individuals. Evolution is one of the most important biological concepts and is probably the most misunderstood concept as well. So let's talk about it. I want you to have a good basic understanding of what I mean when I talk about evolution. 
Very simply, evolution is genetic change within a population, so within a group of organisms, from one generation to the next. So the idea of evolution tells us that genetic change can build up in the DNA within a group of organisms as they have babies, as they reproduce and pass their genes on from one generation to the next. Sometimes this genetic change can lead to physical changes and behavioral changes. So sometimes many generations down the line, those populations are going to behave and look different than their ancestors did. There are two sources for genetic change within organisms, mutations and recombination. Mutations are random changes that can occur in DNA. So we often refer to them as being mistakes in the DNA. And this can alter how the DNA functions. We'll take a look at mutations later on in the semester. Recombination is a part of sexual reproduction. It allows organisms to make new combinations, new groupings of their DNA as they pass that DNA on to the next generation. For example, when your mom and your dad decided to have you, they each took one half of their DNA and they combined them. And that combination is you. You are a new combination of their DNA. That's recombination. The thing that drives evolution, that causes organisms' DNA to change in particular ways, is known as natural selection. And you can think of this as environmental pressure. When the environment changes, sometimes those changes make it more beneficial to have certain DNA, certain genes, than other genes. For instance, if the environment becomes very cold over a long period of time, it's more beneficial to have genes that allow you to survive that cold than genes that allow you to survive in very hot environments. So organisms in that situation with those cold genes are going to be more likely to survive and pass those genes on to more offspring than the ones that have the genes for surviving hot weather. So in that particular case, the natural selection might drive the population towards retaining those specific genes. That's natural selection. Evolution through natural selection implies that physical change, sometimes pretty radical physical change, can occur within populations of organisms over time. For instance, fossil evidence indicates that the earliest tetrapods, these early four-legged animals, likely evolved from certain populations of fish. Now, how did they make that leap? How did they figure that out? Well, if you look at the limbs of four-legged animals, you find certain kinds of bones. And if you look in the fins of certain types of fish, you find the same pattern of bones. And this implies a relatedness between the later amphibians and the earlier, we call them lobe-finned fish. The theory of evolution implies a relatedness among all living things on the genetic level. A lot of people aren't comfortable with that idea. You know, we don't like to think of ourselves as being related to bacteria and worms and lowly plants and things like that, right? We like to think of ourselves as being superior and smarter and having dominion over all living things. But if you look at the DNA of these organisms, it tells a different story. It might surprise you to learn that 70% of your DNA is identical to a typical mouse's. That 50% of your DNA is identical to the average banana, believe it or not. So the more closely related two organisms are, the more closely related their DNA will be to one another. Um, but this implies that there is a relatedness among all living things and that all living things likely came from the same original genetic source. At this point, I'd like to pause and let you think about the eight characteristics of life. Remember that if something displays all eight characteristics, we consider it alive in biology. And if it doesn't, we consider it non-living. Even if it's only missing one characteristic, we tend to put it in the non-living category, although there's debate about that sort of thing with things like viruses and prions. For this exercise, I want you to think about a really sophisticated photocopier.
There's some pretty darn sophisticated photocopiers out there. In fact, I used to work with one that if you kicked it accidentally, it would go into a diagnostic mode and repair itself. It seemed an awful lot like a living thing to me. I want you to think about a photocopier, and I want you to list out the characteristics of life that you think it has and the ones that you think it lacks. You'll find this exercise on your guided notes, and from this you can decide for yourself if you think a photocopier is alive or a non-living thing.